are still coming, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, well, I want to welcome you all here. I'm Emily Fopp, and I'm the Professional Development Manager for Campus Compact, and I also serve as the current chair of the Graduate Student Network of the International Association for Research on Service Learning and Community Engagement, or IRSLICE, which is one of the co-organizers for Dissertation DISH. If you know any current or future graduate students interested in service learning and community engagement, encourage them to join the Grad SN. I found it to be invaluable community of support during my PhD program. Um, Trina will drop a link in the chat for more information. I'm excited to be here with my colleagues today, including our main speaker, Dr. Carmen Parati. I want to provide some background on this webinar series for those who may not have attended previous sessions. The dis dissertation DISH is a collaboration between the International Association for Research on Service Learning and Community Engagement, or IRSLICE, Imagining America, and LEAD California. Dis dissertation DISH webinars are meant for all audiences, from seasoned scholars to practitioners to graduate students, as well as journal editors and conference organizers seeking scholars to present the most current and innovative research. Dissertation DISH webinars serve to lift up and highlight some of the most recent research that has been done in the community engagement field, create a way for journal editors and conference organizers to be exposed to new research and strong presenters, and offer some support and possible guidance for those who are in graduate programs by way of tips from those who have just gone through this experience. So far, we have hosted six dissertation DISH webinars, and we have had over 450 unique individuals attend these webinars. We're excited for you to join us today as we feature the dissertation of Dr. Carmen Parati, Assistant Director of Community Engaged Scholarship at the, in the Swear Center at Brown University. Dr. Parati will be discussing his dissertation topic when there's good, there's good. When there's harm, there's harm. Diverse voices on community engagement. However, if you would like to see recordings of each past webinar, you can find those on the Lead California YouTube channel. Finally, I'm going to go over some logistics and then I will turn it over to my co-moderator, Dr. Tania Mitchell. Our agenda for the next 90 minutes or so includes, first, a presentation from Dr. Parati for about 20 to 25 minutes. Then a moderated Q&A session will follow for the next 30 minutes. And finally, an in-depth, informal conversation with Dr. Parati will conclude the final 30 minutes of the webinar. We also have a few housekeeping items before we begin the presentation. We encourage you to rename yourself by clicking on the three lines in the upper right corner of your video image, then click rename and add your organization. Please also share your pronouns. We also recommend that you select speaker mode in your Zoom panel, as there are a lot of folks on the call, and this will allow you to keep the speakers front and center. Kindly keep yourself muted during the presentation, and if you have any questions during the webinar, <clears throat> please post those in the chat. We will be keeping track of your questions for our Q&A session a little later. During the moderated Q&A session, we will review these questions submitted via the chat. Lastly, a reminder that we're recording this webinar and it will be available in a day or two on LEAD California's YouTube channel. We'll send out a link once it's available. And with that, I wanna welcome my co-moderator, Dr. Tania Mitchell to introduce herself and our dissertation speaker. Tania, over to you. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, welcome everyone. I wanna join um, Emily and our colleagues from Imagining America Campus Compact and LEAD California for joining us today. Um, I am thrilled to have the opportunity to participate in this dissertation dish today. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tania Mitchell. I'm an associate professor of higher education at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I have been working in service learning and community engagement for the last 20 something years now. <laughs> uh, and in my role at the University of Minnesota, one of my privileges is that I have the opportunity to train and um, advise doctoral students. And so today, the dissertation that we are going to be learning more about comes from one of my recent graduates, uh, Dr. Carmen Ferrati. Uh, Carmen, as you heard, is currently an assistant director of community engaged scholarship at uh, the Swear Center for Public Service at Brown University. 
And beginning this fall will be a new assistant professor of public and community service studies at Providence College. So we are thrilled um, that he gets to share his research. Uh, this is a really exciting and um, a really uh, unique dissertation um, exploring the perspectives and experiences of community partners in a community engagement partnership. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Parati to share his work with you all. Thank you again for being here. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Mitchell. Really appreciate uh, you being here and uh, welcome all. I remember when uh, a previous presenter shared their dissertation on this webinar series, they said that uh, revisiting their dissertation felt like coming back to an old friend. Uh, and like colleagues who have presented before me, I defended my dissertation almost two years ago. Uh, I'm grateful for Lead California, IR Slice, and Imagining America for hosting the dissertation uh, DISH webinar series and for the opportunity for me to come back to an old friend and share my work with you all today. I see several familiar faces on the call, uh, some who have read various drafts of my dissertation or have heard iterations of this presentation. So thank you for being here and for being willing to listen and think with me again. And I also wanna thank Dr. Mitchell, my doctoral advisor for co-moderating this session and for continuing to be a critical friend to me and my work. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my slides now. So my hope is, Emily, I'm seeing you. Could you give me a thumbs up? I'm hoping you're seeing my slides. Awesome, great. So we have about uh, 60 minutes together uh, for both my presentation and the Q&A session. And then for those who are available, as Emily said, we'll have an additional 30 minutes to dive into a deeper discussion. Today, I'm going to situate my larger dissertation but I'm going to focus my presentation mainly on the last two chapters, uh, sorry, the last chapter of uh, my dissertation, which is a chapter that I'm continuing to think through and planning slash hoping uh, to write more about soon. Oops, sorry about that, computer froze. All right, so first uh, I wanna start by situating my scholarly agenda which is rooted in my own experiences as a former service learning and community engagement student at Providence College, my work in higher education policy, my doctoral studies, and as a community engaged scholar practitioner today across multiple institutions, both at Brown University and within the Swear Center, as well as through an adjunct faculty role I have at College Unbound. These various experiences, the inputs that are listed here, have culminated into shaping uh, my scholarly agenda, an agenda that takes up both the theory and practice of community-engaged scholarship to explore the aims of community engagement, the policies and procedures enacted by institutions to meet those aims, and the locus of campus community partnerships, or considering who campuses partner with and why, and the impact those partnerships have. My thinking has, of course, been shaped by the various places and people whom I've worked with. Uh, and I want to acknowledge again, Dr. Mitchell, who has helped me think through and articulate these buckets of my work. Driving much of my scholarship, including the dissertation, is a question that Nadine Cruz and Dwight Giles asked the field of service learning and community engagement over two decades ago. Where's the community and service learning research? And this question is still critically relevant today. Thus, my scholarship aims to explore community impacts of engagement initiatives and practices within US higher education. I'm gonna situate my broader dissertation in just a minute, but I wanna start with this map. So through this map, we see where my research setting uh, and context took place, including Providence College, which I'll refer to as PC, and that's the bluish star here. Uh, and we see that PC is embedded within a conflux of three neighborhoods, the blue, the pink, and the green shaded areas, as well as two political or what Providence calls city council boundaries. And these are the black and the blue outlined areas. Thus, we also see through this map how campuses like PC are not separate from, but rather part of a larger ecosystem, which is an important aspect of my work. 
Zooming in on the map shows where my dissertation research took place, Smith Hill, which is a neighborhood that abuts the southeast corner of Providence College's campus and where I was first introduced to community engagement and spent much of my time as an undergraduate student. While PC has worked in several neighborhoods throughout Providence, since the mid-1990s, the college has developed a core relationship with Smith Hill nonprofits and community leaders, working on projects ranging from affordable housing, community gardens, and after-school programs, to a youth-positive space for gang-involved youth, a cafe, and the PC Smith Hill Annex, which is the red dot here. And uh, the annex is a third space, if you will, a space for dialogue and collaboration between campus and community. Um, and the college has rented this space in the neighborhood over a number of years. In my research, I draw on critical theory as analytic tools to interpret and make meaning of data. And specifically for my dissertation, I drew on whiteness studies to understand the current and historic racial power dynamics of community engagement and to imagine more equitable possibilities. I also drew on neoliberalism to consider how business culture shapes various aspects of society, including higher education and nonprofits. I've limited time today for this presentation, so this is all I'm going to say about theory for now, but I'm, I'm happy to come back and talk more about it during our discussion. My dissertation drew on two primary research questions, and I'm just gonna pause here and let you all read those. And I situated my research setting in context through the previous maps, but I'll briefly add that PC is a regionally selective, predominantly white Catholic liberal arts college in Providence, Rhode Island. And in 1993, the college received a $5 million grant to establish a bachelor's degree in public and community service studies, which is the program that Tania mentioned that I'll be starting to work at this coming fall. Uh, and PC credits itself as the first higher ed institution in the country to offer such a degree, which has been recognized as a national model for community engagement. And Smith Hill is a 0 0.65 square mile neighborhood with a total population of around 6,100 residents, and it's a predominantly lower uh, income and multiracial community. To examine my research questions within this context, I drew on case study research and qualitative methods primarily uh, in-depth interviews. Because community engagement has largely operated in a binary of campus and community, with the community most often being represented by nonprofits, I was intentional about exploring my research questions from multiple voices and perspectives, including campus stakeholders, so students, staff, and faculty, as well as two community groups the Smith Hill Partners Initiative, or SHPI, as they refer to themselves as, and the Smith Hill Advocacy and Resources Partnerships, or SHARP. SHPI consists of mainly nonprofits and is a space for various stakeholders to come together to discuss community development. Some of the nonprofits that make up SHPI have formal partnerships with the college, and SHPI is also recognized as the official neighborhood association for Smith Hill by the City of Providence. SHARP is a grassroots organization of residents also working on community development in the neighborhood. Members of SHARP worried that the nonprofits that made up SHPI didn't necessarily represent residents' concerns, so they went ahead and formed their own group that was separate from the group of nonprofits. So in total, I interviewed 21 people across these three organizations and had about a, a, an additional dozen informal conversations with uh, community members and stakeholders to inform my work. My overall findings were filled with contradictions of community engagement as both good and harmful, and how students as well as staff and faculty are centered in doing both good work in communities and having the potential to impose harm. For example, community members referenced uh, the college's community engagement efforts in the students as a saving grace and as an example of community relations between the college and Smith Hill. And resident parents specifically talked about college students being instrumental to supporting after-school youth programs in the neighborhood. However, community members also referred to the short-term transactional dynamics of community engagement that often favor student learning over community impact, and how these and other aspects of community engagement 
can uphold racial power dynamics between students and communities, producing fear and deficit-based thinking about communities, colorblind racism and white saverism, and a lack of understanding of the root causes that created the need for community engagement in the first place. As I previously mentioned, I want to zoom in on a specific chapter from my dissertation to discuss how some residents saw the college as an agent that participated in both this good and harm of community engagement through one campus community partnership. Something that stood out to me almost immediately in my data collection was the ways in which residents questioned who students primarily worked with through community engagement. In the quote, Patricia, who was a resident member of SHARP, was referencing community cleanup type events, tree plantings and food drives and other, other things like that, that the college periodically co-sponsored with a local nonprofit, the Smith Hill Community Development Corporation, what Patricia refers to in the quote as the CDC. Focusing on the bolded sections of the quote, Patricia expressed frustration with how various forms of community engagement often place students working with nonprofit staff rather than connecting and working alongside residents. Adding to this frustration, Patricia noted that students were with people that look just like them and live elsewhere, calling attention to the fact that the CDC staff were predominantly white and did not live in the neighborhood, much like the college students. This theme continued as Janice, another resident member of SHARP, made a similar point when talking about the differences between the residents that made up SHARP and the nonprofit staff that made up SHIPPY. Considering both the quotes from Patricia and Janice, we could begin to see how campuses and nonprofits can mirror one another regarding their work in, but not necessarily with the community, leading to questions around who campuses tend to partner with and why, and if those partnerships truly represent the community. I wanna stick with this example that Patricia provided of students uh, working alongside the CDC staff because the CDC has been a key community partner of PC since the mid 1990s and helps illustrate these contradictions of good and harm within this one partnership. PC and the CDC had worked together on several key community projects in Smith Hill, some that I have previously mentioned. Uh, and the college also had provided the CDC with financial resources to support their affordable uh, housing work. On the one hand, participants saw good in the work of the CDC. Residents saw value in the work the CDC was doing around affordable housing, as well as the various youth programs that the CDC was involved in with the college. On the other hand, residents had experienced the CDC, which was originally started by a group of local community leaders to come to resemble a business. As residents witnessed the corporatization of the CDC, what we might refer to as the nonprofit industrial complex undergirded by whiteness and neoliberalism, residents experienced a largely white staff who were not from Smith Hill making decisions around funding, priorities, and staffing that one resident said did not always have the best interest of the community in mind. And we could see how Heather's quote on the bottom of this slide connects to Patricia and Janice's previous concerns about the differences between working in rather than with the community, as well as demonstrates one way that the CDC has caused harm in the neighborhood as being an organization focused on affordable housing, but also having the ability and power to evict people. Because of these contradictions and as a student and instructor of critical theory, I leaned into the critical community engagement literature and started questioning how campus community partnerships might contribute to both the good and harm of community engagement. And in discussing this with uh, community members um, and, and specifically how the CDC has caused harm in the community, the local councilwoman at the time talked about PC putting most of their eggs in the CDC's basket which she said could be perceived by residents as enabling the harm that the organization has caused in the neighborhood. My intention here is not to single out the CDC as a harmful organization, because as previously mentioned, residents saw good in their work. And I want to note that I'm, of course, glossing over much history and context for the purpose of this presentation today. But I focus on the CDC to demonstrate how 
campus community partnerships can contribute to both that good and harm of community engagement. While my larger dissertation aimed to explore how various community members described and understood their experiences with community engagement, I ended my research with more questions specifically related to who is the community and what would it mean for campuses to approach their community engagement work as neighbors. This idea of campuses needing to see themselves as neighbors came up from several resident members of SHARP who referenced this quote, which is a quote from the former PC president at the opening of the PC Smith Hill Annex. Residents specifically noted that this was the first time that they had ever heard a leader from the college acknowledge PC as part of Smith Hill. So I come back to this map, which is where I started to re-emphasize how campuses need to see themselves as not separate from, but part of their host communities, recognizing their place, roles, and responsibilities to the community as part of the community. Through my dissertation and my continued thinking since defending the dissertation, I share key questions and considerations that resident members of SHARP express as essential in forming campus community dialogue and collaborations from nonprofits to neighbors. Residents stress that partnerships should be deeply relational, emphasizing place, but not necessarily going into a place, but how to see yourself as part of that place and understanding who you are partnering with and for what purposes. Residents further provided several approaches and values that they saw as leading to more equitable campus community partnerships. Ultimately, residents argue that an emphasis on authentic relationships could lead to greater action within community engaged partnerships. Like any good research, I was left with more questions than I started with and have continued to identify new questions, uh, some which are represented here and all that I hope will uh, continue to drive my future work. I'm just going to pause here for a couple seconds and, and let you read these on your own. Finally, I want to acknowledge that my dissertation was grounded in a very specific context of, at Providence College and within the Smith Hill neighborhood. And much like communities, this idea of being a neighbor or neighborliness is not going to be monolithic across all higher ed institutions and the communities in which campuses partner with. So in addition to further developing what it means to be a good neighbor in the context of my dissertation uh, and through my new role as an incoming assistant professor at Providence College, I'm interested in understanding this idea of neighborliness from, for instance, various institutional and geographic contexts, as well as diverse student populations. So I'm gonna uh, pause there and stop uh, sharing my screen and I'm looking forward to uh, being in conversation with you all. Thank you for listening. Carmen, um, just really quickly, is it possible for you to re- um, relaunch the screen with your questions that you were thinking about on it. Yeah, I think um, there's some interest in, in being able to access those questions. Yeah. All right, could you all see those questions? Hopefully. Can you read them aloud as well so those of us who are on smaller screens can um, hear them in your voice? Sure, happy to. So as I said, these are um, questions that I was left with and continuing to thinking about and or hoping uh, to take up in future work. And there are uh, five of them, I think. Um, first one, how might campuses make more intentional efforts to connect with and work alongside residents and nonprofits to increase the impact that they could have through community engagement? Second one, how might campuses partnering as neighbors with neighbors look similar or different from what currently happens with more traditional nonprofit campus community partnerships? Next, 
How might shifting the meaning of partnership from nonprofits to neighbors impact the community work that campuses and their students participate in? What might community engaged teaching, learning, and research look like from the perspective of being a neighbor? And finally, how can we think about being a neighbor beyond community engagement? What other practices, places, institutions, structures, and societies might represent this idea of neighborliness? Thank you again for sharing these questions. And Carmen, thanks so much for your research. Um, I think that what continually stands out to me about your project is the importance of listening to community members, right? So much of our um, so much of our efforts at understanding the experiences and impacts of community and community-engaged scholarship has typically focused in, as you've said, on the nonprofit relationship, those nonprofit partners. And we end up um, you know, almost patting ourselves on the back for 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 the the continued functioning of those relationships um, without paying much attention sometimes to the experiences of community members most impacted by that work. And so I thank you again for um, centering the work and the people um, who who for, for whom the consequences are greatest in in these efforts of community engagement. Um, I think it's just a really powerful way to approach this work and also a really powerful to hear those voices um, centered so boldly in your in your work. So thank you again. Um, the question that I am most interested in um, that you've offered here is what might community engaged teaching, learning and research look like from the perspective of being a neighbor? Right. So I think one of the things that um, is is challenging and also provocative about your work is this idea of moving again from nonprofits to neighbors. Um, but what does that actually mean for our practice? How do we move our work from the most common forms of partnerships and relationships that we've developed, the work that emanates through those spaces into something that represents our positions, perspectives, um, and hopes as neighbors who see their, ourselves as part of this community? How do you recommend to us that we might change or think differently about the ways that we approach this work? Yeah, for sure. I, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen if that's okay, just so I could, I could see folks. It's helpful to have a conversation when I'm seeing everybody. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate that question. You know, I think that is uh, something that I'm uh, excited to think about in the context of uh, this new role that I'll be starting um, in in the fall. But, you know, one thing I think I've been thinking a lot about and has certainly uh, informed my current practice since uh, defending my dissertation is kind of the role of place within community engaged learning. And for so often, I think uh, the field of service learning and community engagement has had this emphasis on, on service, on this direct service, counting hours, submitting those hours, getting graded or having, you know, on those hours. And in my current teaching, both at College Unbound and um, within the Department of Education at Brown University, right, really thinking about how do we center uh, community knowledge and expertise in the classroom and thinking less about discourses of service and really thinking about how do we encourage students to come to know, see themselves, the issues they care about, their campuses in relation to the people and places that they intend to engage with. So for me, in thinking about this idea of being a neighbor, it's really centering the places that students intend to engage with in the classroom. So that could look like um, centering local resources um, uh, that are produced by city politics or nonprofit organizations and centering those, uh, signing those as, as readings, for example, um, having community-based guest speakers in the classroom and compensating them. Um, engaging in site visits or neighborhood walking tours, um, having students uh, 
do some activities, do power mapping and asset mapping about issues that they care about uh, as part of the classroom experience. All of these things where students get to uh, kind of get, get a breadth understanding of the places that they're going to work with, but aren't focused on this, on this notion of doing service. Um, so, so those are some ways I think in my current practice. And again, um, neither of the courses that I teach right now uh, are, are necessarily like working with a partner, for example. Uh, but will be de definitely something that I'll that I'm thinking about as I'm entering into this new role. Uh, you know, I guess the yeah, I'll end there, and we'll and we'll have more conversation. <laughs> Thanks, Carmen. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, I really love your topic and was so impressed with the results you came through with. Um, I have a few questions of my own, but I see we have questions already starting in the chat. I encourage others to, um, to, to include your questions so we can start our Q&A. Um, I wanna start with the first question that just came through. We actually had a comment first from Rachel Burson. She said, shifting the focus from nonprofit to neighbors is a powerful concept. Thank you for sharing this important work and sparking thought. And then Carrie Hutnick asked the first question, they said, forming long-term neighborly relationships between campus and community doesn't always align with the traditional metrics of social or community impact in higher ed and associated pressures. How might we shift this narrative when advocating for more resources to support long-term slow relational work and the relational impacts of increased accountability and co-creation of knowledge and change? Mm, good question. I may need you to repeat. Uh repeat parts of that. Um, so so is, is the question around, um, yeah, do you mind just maybe just breaking that down into uh, one one question there, like the first part? Sure. Um, well, the, the crux of the question, I think, comes at the end. How might we shift this narrative when advocating for more resources and support long-term slow relational work and the relational impacts of increased accountability and co-creation of knowledge and change. Yeah. You know, I, I guess what I'm what I'm thinking about is that yeah, these this type of relationship uh work doesn't typically fall within the traditional higher ed settings or necessarily um academic calendars, for example. Um but I'm I'm thinking about like my own work as I'm about to re-enter this space in, in a new role and and thinking about like the importance of listening and learning both at the college and community levels as well as relationship building across the college and community and considering both like the personal knowledge that I know about the community, what I know, what I don't know, what do I need to know to be an effective facilitator of this work and then thinking about how I could connect my courses um, to community partner priorities, recognizing that the work of higher ed is, you know, our work is long term and often slow, but we could start off with, you know, portions, uh, smaller portions, kind of chunks of engagement with community partners, and we have the opportunity for those to grow and develop over periods of time into more um, substantial, sustainable, uh, transformative partnerships and work. Um, but it also means that we have to be uh, really nimble to adapt to community partner priorities. And I, to me, I think really investing in relationships is key, like really starting slow and small. So something may start off as like direct service hours, but then build semester to semester, year to year over to something much more deeper and sustainable. Um, and, and focusing on those relationships, I think, allows us as facilitators of community engagement to be, um, to make that nimbleness more possible, to be able to respond to priorities and changes within our institutions, but still centering community. I hope that somewhat responds to the question. That's great. And we have a few others coming in. So um, continue the discussion in the chat. I appreciate that. Um, our next question comes from Madeline Stewart. She asks, I wonder if Dr. Parati sees it as important for students as a starting point to acknowledge their status as short-term neighbors, 
about four years as a college student versus local residents who might be in the community for decades or a lifetime? Yeah, I think this is a, a great question and it's certainly like thinking about the community engagement across the lifespan of our different students. And on that last slide is, you know, something that I'm continuing and want to think about is how this idea of being a neighbor or neighborliness uh, shows up across uh, different, as I said, institutional and geographic contexts, but also student populations, right? So my work at uh, College Unbound, which is focused on adult learners returning to college to earn their first degree, many of the students at College Unbound are longtime Providence residents and community leaders. And what that does in the classroom is it allows us to redefine who is a student, who is an expert, who is a community practitioner. That looks different in, in my teaching at Brown at, with more traditional age college uh, and university students around the 18 to 24 year old who, who as you said, are, are coming to Providence, likely most not from Providence and likely won't be in Providence uh, in the future. Some will, but not all, right? So I think um, that that's one thing that I'm interested in continuing to think about is, is how this translates across different uh, diverse student populations. Um, and, you know, and with that more traditional um, student population, part of the reason, at least in my teaching thus far, I've been really emphasizing more and students to come to know, understand, see themselves, et cetera, in relation to communities that they're going to work with is, I think by really centering that place-based approach, um, we have the opportunity to mitigate less harm when we send students out into communities by having them really uh, come to understand the communities in which they're going to work with, not through a deficit-based lens, not through an us versus them lens, but trying to understand the people and places that, that they're going to do work within. Thank you. Our next question comes from Katie Evans. Katie says, I am not well versed in literature on neighborliness, but I have a, I'm sorry, but have thought a lot about how to get students and professional peers to care about people they don't know and how that approach can align with DEI efforts, in particular, given our, in particular, given other campus strategic priorities, energies, et cetera. Curious if you see your thoughts on this, both in practice and in scholarship. Let me know if you'd like me to reread re that. Yeah, I'll, I'll start and then uh, you could redirect me if uh, you need to. But um, yeah, I'm not well versed in uh, ideas uh, in literature on neighborliness either. It's uh, something that um, really came up uh, through uh, residents talking about this idea of wanting um, the college to see to see themselves uh, as a neighbor. So uh, throughout my dissertation and throughout this chapter, I really rely on a, a participant voice um, to really kind of drive the narrative in my writing. Um, and as I'm continuing to write, I'm writing a piece on this right now, really, really trying to balance with that, of like how much do I try to engage with literature, but also um, and or just let kind of the participants speak for themselves uh, of this call that they're asking, which I think is a pretty significant call. Because this idea of neighborliness does not dismiss nonprofits by any means. That's not what I'm arguing. It's it's rather how do we have a more reflective and uh, collaborative relationship between campuses, between nonprofits, and between residents, uh, between as you know in my in my instance these three different organizations um, that are all doing similar but different work. Um, so I'm excited to uh, engage more with this idea of uh, neighborliness, and I, I think um, we've certainly seen this term neighbor come up uh, in light of, uh, in response to the pandemic, you know, I'm thinking about uh, Tania's piece in the wake of multiple pandemics and liberal education, right, she, she poses some similar questions around what does it mean to be a neighbor, there's some, I was a recent blog post and there's another book that Silas posted with this idea of neighborhood democracy. So I'm excited to, to think through and continuing uh, to work through this uh, idea and, and really, um, you know, we'll have the opportunity to, to do this more so with, with the folks that I engage with for my dissertation, given um, my transition coming up. 
Great, and a related question on the topic of neighborliness. Catherine Letiri, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, asks, the concept of neighborliness is very grassroots. How do we balance and leverage to down tools like Carnegie or state and national funding and policies to meet this under need? Mm. Sorry, I, that was, that, those are typos. Um, so yeah, so basically neighborliness is this very grassroots concept and I love it. And I'm also thinking about, um, cause I'm out here in California, we're dealing with a lot of, you know, there's a lot of state programs and funding. Um, there's stuff going on at the national level. We've got Carnegie, like we have all of these tools that um, are external and potentially more top down. Um, and it, so I'm trying to think about how do we balance those um, because you know, funding often drives research and engagement, right? Um, and how do we balance those against wanting to remain neighborly and be grassroots and hold that space? Yeah. What opportunities do you see, Carmen? Yeah, I'd say, you know, one, you know, I'm thinking about um, a piece by, as you're talking, Catherine, I'm thinking about a piece by Byron White, who, you know, he talks about how residents don't see higher education as valuable because residents don't have a seat at the table. Um, and thinking about that top down approach that you're that you're talking about. So right, I think there, and, and this is certainly, you know, I was in a community meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago and it was with residents and uh, local um, community, local campus stakeholders and uh, residents were upset about something that the campus was doing. And, you know, they kept just saying like, it would have been different if, if we had a voice or if we had a seat at the table or if we were made aware of X before it happened, right? So thinking about, um, how do we engage more in community conversations and community dialogue? I, community being both on campus and, and between campus and communities. So like, how do we foster? I, I think one of the things that came up in my dissertation context a lot is, and I think this is true for a lot of institutions, is that community engagement is not institutionalized within one specific office. So there are all of these different places and people doing this work, and there's not always collaboration and communication across campus units. And then how does that get translated off campus? Um, so, so thinking about like starting internally with those conversations um, and then in translating that off campus, right? Because I think there, you know, there, some of these things you're mentioning are, uh, you know, certainly important. Um, and, you know, Carnegie and whatnot, these signals of community engaged campuses, these funding opportunities, and at least from um, this research, I don't think any of my participants would say like those things shouldn't happen. Um, but what they did say is that it is really noticeable, the marketization, um, that hyper individualism of whiteness and neoliberals and the commodification that they see when campuses are solely focused on uh, on this recognition, on taking photos, for example, at like that was a huge thing that residents uh, kept saying was like they're tired of campuses coming in uh, and taking photos of students doing work to promote, right? So, so just thinking about um, uh, how we might engage uh, residents in those conversations, like, and I, I think we'd be surprised, like, residents know some of that has to happen and would probably. Um, agree with some of that, but if, if they had a voice in uh, at the table, um, that might look different. Thank you. I'm going to shift here a little bit to Janine Gilmer. Janine says, at Augsburg in Minneapolis, we've been thinking through ways to develop sort of community faculty and go beyond bringing people to campus and instead getting students off campus. We do mostly partner with nonprofits, but those nonprofits are typically quite reflective of the communities in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Basically, we really want to make, make it clear that we are learners in these spaces more often than not and center knowledges and experiences of community members. Any ideas about how to develop this kind of community faculty or examples? Yeah, I mean, and I'd say there, I, I'm looking across the 
a list of folks who are here and there are uh, some people I know who have done this work and are experts in this work and, and happy to connect offline. Um, but I'll say the community faculty uh, is a great model. Um, I uh, my first introduction to service learning and community engagement uh, was with a community faculty member from Smith Hill, uh, who was then a, a key informant and key participant that was centered within my dissertation study. Uh, so if you have the opportunity um, to, to take a look at my dissertation, Miss Althea is is a model of that someone who was a community faculty member at at Providence College um, and and really was in many ways that that bridge between campus and community of you know something i it, this question makes me think of something i heard a lot in my data collection was that um the annex for example that i mentioned was which is this third space um in many institutions brown has one as well many institutions have these third spaces for collaboration is that um community members uh talked about the annex as being a, a bridge, like I said, between campus and community. Um, but it was at times they felt like it was only an opportunity for the campus to come into the community. They didn't feel like community could go to campus. So I, 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 I'm saying that because it makes me think of this idea of community faculty members of, of how do we really foster that that you know bi-directional relationship um, so that it, there's this constant exchange going back and forth so it's not just one way. Um, uh, the other thing I'd just say is like, I think anytime we ask community partners uh, to do labor for the institution, uh, we should be appropriately compensating them. Uh, so if we're asking someone to participate in a class, whether it is a uh, our guest facilitation, uh, a walking tour or a site visit and or a 16 week or whatever your semesters are co-facilitators in that space, um, we should be compensating them uh, just like we would compensate instructors and grad students and whatnot to uh, facilitate those community engagement experiences for our students. So uh, so that is uh, that is key. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think it's you know, in this unique situation is, you know, to me, I said, this is a unique community-based case study, right? Those, those spaces exist, the resident space, the nonprofit uh, space, there's a lot of overlap between those spaces too, right? So um, I, I feel like when I'm entering this new role uh, that in the fall, I, I'm privileged in a way because I know all of these uh, players already, this space is set up in, in many ways for, you know, to continue to foster uh, campus community dialogue. And there's a lot of work to be done, but it's, it, you know, there's, it's, a, it's a fruitful space where both parties are, are eager to be involved. Um, but, but it may take more work to kind of find uh, those community faculty member, uh, campus faculty member, sorry, community uh, faculty members that aren't necessarily nonprofit uh, stakeholders, right? So how could you lean into local grassroots organizations, places like SHARP, where community residents are coming together, neighborhood meetings or associations, um, and try to build relationships uh, through some of those networks? I think that was a, a great way to wrap up some of the audience questions. We have a number of others, but I want to share one comment that got a lot of support in the chat box um, before we start to shift a little bit. Um, Winoka Yepa um, said, I don't have a question, but more of a comment. First, thank you, Carmen, for your presentation. As a Native American woman whose work is deeply embedded in indigenous research and indigenous education, I believe there needs to be more conversation with those who are currently doing this work in and outside of higher education. As a Native scholar, our work is embedded in relational accountability and reciprocity. When we learn, we learn with our communities. When we do, we do with our communities. This is not a new framework or new idea. It existed long before academia was a thing. So instead of how we can do this work, we should center those who have always been doing this work. Mm -hmm. So I'll invite you to respond to that if you'd like. Um, and I'll ask Melissa, Glen uh, Glenetta, Martin, others who have asked questions to hopefully stick around um, for um, an opportunity to, to ask your questions during our second portion of this uh, ses session. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Emily. I, I just, I really appreciate that. Um, that comment, and I think that's a good good place to close. As you know, I talk about in my work. Yeah, this isn't 
this idea of uh, reciprocity is something that the field of service learning uh, and community engagement uh, center as kind of seminal to our work. Uh, but we, in my opinion, haven't been able to uphold that. And it's not something that um, we've necessarily uh, uh, centered like it's it's it has existed long before the field of service learning between you know community uh, establishing relationships between campuses and communities um and in part that's you know the key to my to my dissertation is really trying to listen to those who have so often been left out of community engagement research um and uh, like I said when I started that we've often assumed uh nonprofits to be a proxy for the community um, but really trying to grapple with who is the community and how you balance various claims of ownership between communities, recognizing the multiple nested uh, communities within one another um, and acknowledging that no community is monolithic, right? So this is this idea of neighborliness is really going to look differently across different institutions. Um, and I'm excited to get to continue this work and uh, learn uh, with and from all of you. So thank, thank you for being here. So Carmen, thank you again so much for your thoughts, for your research and for um, your presentation. The uh, last question that I wanted to ask you, you've engaged with a little bit as we've talked about your transition, um, but I want, I want you to um, just share with us how you are thinking differently, especially coming from your experiences first as a student and then as a researcher in the space and now um, into the role of faculty and actually thinking about preparing your preparing future students um, mm. through public and community service studies. How are you thinking about your work and your research as you begin this process of transitioning roles? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, it's a pretty surreal space to be in. And uh, this is fairly new news, uh, still new news for me. So still holding that, uh, those, those multiple identities, positionalities, uh, kind of all converging into this space. Um, as I, you know, I said in one of my responses, I think, uh, you know, really listening and learning at both the college and community level, as well as relationship building. Yes, I have personal knowledge from student to researcher. Um, but there's also a lot that I don't know and that I need to know to be, like I said, uh, an effective facilitator of this work. And then thinking about how I could deepen those relationships, right? The uh, a tenure track job is, is not, not short term, it's long term. So hopefully this is it for me, right? So there's, a it, there's an opportunity and it's really exciting to be thinking about how to build relationships over a career from course to course, from semester to semester, from year to year, and really thinking about how to deepen and foster uh, those authentic relationships, knowing that things at the institutional level, level are going to change and knowing that community priorities and the people are going to change, right? Of course, one of the limitations of place-based work is you partner with who's showing up, right? And, and those people and places may change throughout my career. Um, but really centering on relationships, I think, is, is key in order for me to be nimble, to respond and react uh, and center my classes and research to community-identified priorities. So as I move into this space, um, I'm, I'm really excited to you know, listen, learn, ask questions, and uh, grow from there. I think that's a great place to wrap up this first portion. Um, thanks for the, the question, Dr. Mitchell. And thank you, Dr. Perotti, for such a thoughtful presentation on your recent dissertation and for fostering a great discussion with our audience. So this concludes our moderated Q&A session. We still have another 30 minutes for a deeper discussion, but we also understand if you can't stay on for this. Before we do transition, a few reminders. We are recording the webinar and it will be available within a week on the Lead California YouTube channel. We'll be sending out a link to all registrants once that's available. Kindly complete the webinar evaluation and help us to improve these webinars. We've placed a link in the chat and this will be emailed as well. I'm excited to share that the next Dissertation Dish webinar will be on June 8th and will feature Dr. Trina Van Skindel, Membership uh, Director, Imagining America, artists and scholars in public life, 
Dr. Van Skyndel's dissertation research topic was a qualitative inquiry into community engaged practitioner scholar professional identity development through participation in a community engagement association's graduate student fellowship. I think she's going to put that in the chat in case I fumbled there. <laughs> um, more details and registration links are in the chat and will also be emailed to all those who registered for this webinar. For the next 30 minutes, we'll allow participants to, in, to uh, connect unmoderated with Dr. Parati for a more engaging conversation. So please join us. And I am going to go ahead and open the floor to anyone that wants to start us off with a question. There were some really great questions in the chat that we 